If there was ever a species that embodied the eternal war engulfing the galaxy, it would be the orcs. A race born to fight, the orcoid races have become a scourge the galaxy over, possibly the most numerous of all that knows nothing save war. Their simple culture belies their danger, as they have the power to create incredible, if ramshackle, technology, harness the warp, or even make impossible things happen simply with the power of belief. The only thing truly keeping the orcs in check is the orcs themselves, as their highly aggressive nature means they will war amongst each other if warbands clash or when an upstart subordinate decides to challenge his boss, which is probably every couple of days if there's no common enemy to smash. Their empires cannot be bargained with or subdued, and killing them does not mean that a world will be free of orcs for long. If the orc race were ever to truly unite, then nothing could hope to stand in their way. Today, we catalogue what we know of their race, looking at their history, their societal structure, and how an orc war comes to be. My name is Michael for Tactica Imperialis, and welcome to 40k Stories. Orcs have been around for as long as any human can remember. Their origins are not clearly catalogued, due to the fact that orcs are not record keepers and instead pass on stories by word of mouth. However, there is one group of orcs who tell a tale of their beginnings, the runt herds who take care of the Gretchen and Snotlings that make up the lower classes slash food of orc society. They tell the Brain Boys, a ruling caste of the orcish race who were similar in size to Gretchen and who created the orcs and their cousins to protect them. The fate of the Brain Boys is unknown. Some say they evolved into Gretchen, others that they went extinct naturally, but what is known is that the Brain Boys no longer exist, for whatever reason. Seemingly aware that their death was coming, they supposedly gifted their servants with the ability to create technology and resist injury far beyond other races through artificial DNA. There is evidence, however, that the Orcs were in fact a creation of the Old Ones. Known as the Crocs back then, don't know why they changed the name, they were made as warriors to fight the Necrons and the Catan, as well as the warp entities known as Enslavers who were menacing the Old Ones Empire. Of course, they technically failed as the Old Ones have since died out or disappeared, but they are certainly more than capable fighters as any race who's faced them can attest. It may well in fact be that both tales are true to some extent. After all, the description of the brain boys provided by the runt herds is incredibly vague, and we don't know how big the old ones actually were. The plague that wiped out the old ones in orcish mythology could have been the enslavers or the necrons at a stretch, and it's highly probable that the Crocs were given a bunch of critical survival traits by the Old Ones due to their desperation. We may never know for sure whether the Orcs are creations of the Old Ones, creations of another species, an evolution of their kind that became known as the Brain Boys, or simply by good old-fashioned Darwinian evolution. And it's not as though we can sit down for a chat with the Greenskins or travel back a few millennia to clarify, after all. When the Orcs go to war... The ground itself can shake beneath the charge of iron-shod boots, and the sky can turn black from belching smoke. The Greenskins fight amongst themselves constantly, vying for dominance and authority in their various mobs, tribes, etc. But there will come times where a single orc will rise. They will fight their way to the top of the pile, beating every orc with the temerity to challenge them to within an inch of their life until their rule is near undisputed. When they can't go any higher in their own circles, these bosses will try their hand at conquering other tribes, assimilating them into their own or being assimilated themselves under the stronger boss. This cycle of civil war goes on until one warlord will reign supreme over the entire planet or even system, at which point the orcs really become dangerous. United under the warlord, they will smash anything on their world that isn't an orc, gathering as much material as possible in order to send their conquest to the stars. Towering effigies of the orc gods Gork and Mork are constructed in the form of stompers and gargans, and preparations are made to secure themselves a fleet. Eventually, a floating space hulk will arrive in system and is secured by giant tractor beams before being boarded by the orc hordes. It's often the case that the building of the war machines will be as a result of the space hulk's arrival. Once the Hulk is fitted with enough guns and engines to get going and make the Orcs happy with it, they will set sail into the warp. They don't know where they're going, nor do they care, for wherever they end up, there should be something worth fighting. By the time they arrive, the Orcs are itching to get going, and once the world is identified, the war reaches a fever pitch as the invasions begins. 
The orcs themselves generate war energy simply by being together and at war, and this can be somewhat unpredictably channeled by the weird boys who are the orc equivalents to psychers and shamans. And so, with the roar of engines, the staccato thunder of automatic weaponry, and the screaming of brutish war cries, another world is plunged into the madness of an orc war. It is not even enough to defeat the horde and slay the war boss, for orcs release spores when they die that will eventually mature into new feral orcs and Gretchen once more, creating a cycle of eternal war that can only be stopped by cleansing firestorms or exterminatus. Orc society is based on a simple principle. Might makes right. The biggest orcs rule the various tribes and warbands, and the diminutive Gretchen are relegated to menial workers and punching bags. The orcs also never stop growing and grow faster, stronger in battle, and so war bosses and even knobs can be as large as or larger than dreadnoughts at the end of a long, bloody campaign. The largest confirmed orcs would be the prime orcs from the War of the Beast in M32, or maybe Tusk the Demon Killer if he ever shows up in the Material Realm again. The exceptions to the rule are the Odd Boys, who fill the various specialist roles for the Orcs such as Engineers, Medics and Psychers, though in typical Orky fashion they're a lot less consistent or organised than their counterparts in the other races. Mech Boys are the great visionaries and creators of all Orc weaponry and technology, from the humble slugger to the towering Gargans. Often, it will be a mech boy who sets a war into motion, building the war engines that draw other orcs together and set off the fights for dominance. The best of their kind, known as big mechs, are even capable of leading wars themselves, often at the head of clanking walkers in dread mobs bristling with dacca. It is also worth mentioning, though, that the craft of mech boys, whilst incredible to behold and undeniably dangerous to all parties, only work because the power of orc belief says they will work. Dumb umis can't even get a basic shooter to fire. Dumb dumbs. <laughs> Pain boys or docks are the closest approximation to medics for the orcs, capable of mending almost any injury. Orcs are incredibly resilient, able to have limbs reattached, head included, if they can get it sewn on fast enough and capable of receiving all kinds of cybernetic augmentations or being literally plugged into a dreadnought chassis. For exorbitant fees in teeth, the orc currency, a doc can keep almost any orc alive if said orc is mad enough to visit their surgery. Not always a good plan as it turns out, as pain boys are known to experiment on their unconscious patient and can often do more harm than good even if the orc survives. For example, the squig brain transplant. Eesh. There are many other groups of odd boys, such as the aforementioned runt herds and weird boys, or the pilots, known as flyboys. But it must be stated that no odd boy is trained through academies or anything fancy like that. Odd boys just know how to do what they do, for no other reason than they just do. Must be those brain boy coded genetics at work. As for the regular orcs, they generally just join the masses of infantry that the orcs are infamous for but a few rebellious ones will run off to join the Stormboy Academies. These organised boot camps train the Stormboys in endless drilling, though it's pretty common for it to all go out the window once the fighting kicks off and the unpredictable rocket packs fire up. Beyond their tribes, however, almost all Orcs will be, or will have been, a member of one of the six Great Clans. The Great Clans are part social groups, part fighting units, part philosophies. While it is not uncommon for a warband or tribe to be for a single clan, more often than not warriors from a multitude of clans will be thrust together during a war, particularly if the warlord is powerful enough to hold them all in check, or if casualties are sustained. While we do not know which clans are the largest, as keeping track of the orc galactic population is impossible, they are all incredibly large and powerful. The classic orc clan would undoubtedly be the Goths, black-armoured and relatively disciplined hordes of infantry that favour good old-fashioned hand-to-hand combat. Their methodology is simple, but they are incredibly effective at crumping everything in their path, and the most famous warlord of the modern age, Garskul Mag Arugthraka, is a member of the Goth clan. The Evil Sons are big fans of fast vehicles, wearing red armour and even painting their bullets red. Orcs firmly believe that red ones go faster, and because they believe it, well, they do. 
Red vehicles can put on even more speed than other vehicles in lesser colours, and because of their love of going fast, it is common for evil sons to be members of the cult of speed, who we'll discuss another time. The Bad Moons clan is the rich one, for their teeth grow faster, and so they are always in wealth. Thus, Bad Moons can afford the best weapons in bling, wearing ostentatious yellow or gold armour and wielding devastating custom guns. They are the merchant class who do most of the trading, in their favour, of course. But the other orcs don't mind, as they can just knock the teeth out of any bad moon who tries to rise above his station. The stake bites are the most backwards of the great clans, favouring to ride on giant beasts such as squigoths or boars as opposed to in vehicles. They raise the largest number of Gretchen and Snotlings alongside their wild charges, probably just as food if nothing else, and snakebite runt herds are the most skilled of their kind, even if they likely have a smaller proportion of skilled mech boys. A common snake bite tradition is for a young orc to be bitten by a venomous snake and then suck the poison out as a show of strength, and the most famous example will be the legendary weird boy known as Old Zogwart. Snakes won't even attack him anymore. The blood axes are the nearest thing to mercenaries in the orc race, as they will negotiate deals with other races, even if they only do it to get better dacca to use on their former wielders. To the abhorrence of other orcs, particularly the goths, the blood axes will use tactics such as camouflage and even retreat, having learned and adapted human strategies. This clan was supposedly the first to encounter humanity. This, combined with the large number of sneaky commandos in the clan, means that the other clans look down on the blood axes as distrustworthy and unorky. Finally, the death skulls are a rather scrupulous bunch, even by the standards of other orcs nicking anything that isn't nailed down, no matter who it belonged to. Guardsmen, Eldar, the tribe's war boss, doesn't matter. They're even capable of making off with and repairing destroyed vehicles given a few minutes, and looted wagons are a very common sight in a Death Skull warband. It is theorised that Death Skulls would be incredible scientists, maybe rivalling the engineers of other races, but their attention span for what they stole is so short that they never want to bother. The Death Skulls will take ownership of whatever they pilfer by painting it blue, considered a lucky colour to the Orcs. In fact, I've heard tell of Orcs in blue war paint having bullets literally miss them and bounce off. Who knows? Their mechs are legendary, and many looters, renowned as Great Thieves All, are also part of the Death Skull clan. Orcs do not often form long-standing empires, as any warlord worth his teeth is far more concerned with conquering new worlds and smashing heads together than controlling territory he already owns, though I would wager that crumping an upstart warboss or two would still be pretty amusing. Even the greatest and smartest warlords of all would much rather be crusading than sitting around with their lieutenants having all the fun. Any orcish territory that the Greenskins do choose to consolidate is constantly in a state of anarchy, as it weeds out the weakest orcs and keeps any arrogant bosses in check. The nearest things to an exception will be the two orc empires of Octarius and Sharadan. The worlds of Octarius have all fallen victim to the tyrannies of High Fleet Leviathan, who had a portion of their forces redirected there by the legendary Inquisitor Cryptman, yeah, the same one who named the tyrannies all that time ago. Now, only one world remains, Octarius itself. The Tyranids have supposedly brought the Swarm Lord itself to defeat the Orcs, who were led by the overfiend of Octarius, Blacktooth, initially, but are now potentially under the command of Gazkul Thraka, who is on his holy quest from Gork and Mork to bring about the Ragnarok. I've done some videos on Gazkul before, go and check them out. The Empire of Sharadan is located in Ultima Segmentum, not too far from Ultramar, or from Octarius as it turns out. It is led by the pseudo-immortal arch-arsonist of Sharadan, a pyromaniac lunatic. If the arch-arsonist is killed, then his successor takes up his title and persona, keeping the legacy going, and hence why pseudo-immortal. The current arch-arsonist, Snagrod, was responsible for the near annihilation of the Crimson Fist chapter of Space Marines, bringing them down to about 20% strength in the invasion of Rin's world. Wasn't technically Snagrod's fault, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pass over that. Until recently, surgical strikes led by Chief Librarian Tigurius of the Ultramarines had kept the armies of Sharadan in check, but with the encroaching tyrannies in Ultima Segmentum, the Sons of Gwilliman have not been able to devote resources to handling the Orcs. This is perhaps why the Crimson Fist launched their strike against the Arch Arsonist and triggered the invasion of Rin's world. 
but whatever the case, Snagrod has seized his chance to strike towards the Ultramar system. Whether the Arch Arsonist will be able to reduce Ultramar to ash, or will find his forces gunned down by Astartes, or even eaten by Tyranids, remains to be seen. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ah, hang on, sorry, timing. Looks like we're getting close to our next dropout point. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to leave the webway and conclude our tales of the orcs, at the very least for now. There is so much more to say on the Greenskins, and I fully intend to revisit them at least once more in future. But for now, we have arrived at another Legion homeworld. This Legion's Primarch had one of his greatest victories against the orcs, and the Legion would go on to become one of the most renowned and revered in the Great Crusade. So, I hope you can join me next time for that, I'll just be off to the bridge. Thank you all for watching. My name is Michael for Tatsuka Imperialis, and I'll see you all again. Goodbye.